Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Input on the chessboard now and so we can uh, uh, delve into the actual uh, uh, replication studies which are being uh, carried out uh, um, at, at this uh, stage. Um, as Rick uh, told us, there are uh, uh, two or three of them, um, basically two of them, but uh, the first one, uh, so, so both, both of them are in the field of, of uh, one, one branch of history, uh, on the one hand, the history of science and religion, and on, on, the, other, on the other hand, uh, art history. And the replication study on the history of science and religion has been split into two parts, namely, on one hand, a direct replication, as Rick just, Rick just told us what that is, and on the other hand, a conceptual replication. And both will be introduced now um, in turn by the, by the researchers involved. Um, both are about uh, this uh, tremendously influential book by John Hedley Brook. We are very grateful and happy to have him in our midst today. Uh, as the original author of the um, of this book and uh, the, the replication study is particularly directed at one of the chapters uh, called the parallel between scientific and religious reform. I have no doubt that Hans will uh, tell us more about that uh, in a moment and then uh, also Rachel will uh, follow up on that. Um, so I, I'd like to invite Hans to take the floor now. Hans van Eigen, um, you can find his bio in the in the program of the of the, of the workshop. And I can add to that that uh, uh, very recent, just very recently, um, Hans uh, published his second book, uh, The Epistemology of Spirit Beliefs at Routledge. Uh, many congratulations with that. And that shows its wide, um, uh, uh, the, the, the wideness of it and the scope of his scholarship, because he's also an expert on, uh, on uh, the cognitive science of religion. Of course, his doctoral work was about that from a philosophical perspective. And now we are very happy to have him as a postdoctoral researcher on applications in uh, humanities, especially in history of science and religion. On the floor is yours. Thank you. Yes. Hi. Uh, good of you all to come, and nice to be here. Um, I'll just find my PowerPoint. Yes. Okay, so I've been conducting one of the two or three replication studies on this project. Uh, one concerning the uh, original study by John Hedden Brook concerning the history of religion. I'll give you some details in due time. Um, first, a quick heads up. Uh, my son decided to wake me up at five this morning. <laughs> so if I lose my train of thought somewhere, just bear with me and I'll just try to find my grounding. This is what I'll be doing, a brief overview. Somewhat on replication in the humanities, Rick pretty much covered this, so I'll go quickly and maybe skip some stuff. And some background on the original study by John Henry Cook, which he attempted to replicate. And then I'm not going to take you through the whole replication, everything we did, but so focus on two lessons we learned there, two features that came back again and again, and give you some examples for that. So replication, as Rick mentioned, there's like a broad call for replication in other disciplines, mainly social and biomedical sciences, who encounter these, this replication crisis. There are various arguments, Rick mentioned a few, and these all hold for doing re replications in the humanities as well, at least at face value. All these are good reasons to do the same in the humanities and in history, for example. And call for replication often is connected to call for replicability, make studies able to replicate, as Rick mentioned. This often boils down to a call for increased documentation and transparency, it's writing stuff down every step you took and being very clear about how and why you took certain steps in your research. And you can do the same in history, it seems. But here, some issues arise as people point to time and time again the humanities are very different from the social and biomedical sciences. An experiment in psychology might look like that. And like research in humanities, at least traditionally, looks more like this on the right. Very different kinds of research, very different steps taken, very different uh, things that get around to it. Also very different in how uh, humanities scholars write things down compared to psychologists or researchers in biomedical science. And these have implications for applications that we encountered. And now, much of my talk will focus on this issue, like how is replication in the humanities different than that in the psychology or in the biomedical sciences? What are things we should be mindful of when you want to make studies replicable 
can do actual actual replications. So uh, the people who like I got the grant to do the study, they decided on replicating the study by John Henry Brook as a sort of pilot study along with the study on the Rembrandt paintings. Like to really see what lessons we can learn when we try to do actual replications in history. Uh, my replication states rather close to the original research. It counts as a direct replication, as mentioned by Rick, using the same research protocol or roughly, and using the same sources and some new sources. I have to check whether the conclusions are hold given new data or new sources. Now, some more on the original study by John Hattiebrook. So, chapter four or three? I it's three, three. It's three. <laughs> Sorry for that. So, chapter three. What was his goal in that chapter? Uh, like, assess whether there's a link between religious reform during the Reformation in the 16th and 17th centuries, various reformations, and scientific reform, like the emergence of modern science, modern empirical science. Is there any link between them? It's, Religious reform somehow foster scientific reform or pave the way for scientific reform? You can like answer this question in different ways, like here are some, and all are discussed to, to some extent in the chapter by John Hattiebrook, but I'll focus on the last one, whether the Reformation led to certain new values or fostered certain values that paved the road or made people more congenial to accept science or accept science of a certain kind. He says, uh, yeah, a uh, large part of the chapter concerns this. I'm mostly focused on what is known as the Merton thesis, advanced by <coughs> Thomas Merton, it is, I believe. He argued, like in the beginning of the 20th century somewhere, that certain values associated with what he calls radical Protestantism sort of make people more eager or more likely to pursue certain scientific activities. There's theology in the background there, like uh, with religious reform comes certain changes in theology, and this radical Protestant theology like fostered the disworldliness, focusing on this world, what we can achieve here, how we can like become more sanctimonious, become better persons in this life, rather than focusing on otherworldliness, as was more common before, focusing on heaven, the life after God, whatever. You no, know, these people from radical Protestant circles they focus more on this life which would lead more to better scientific activity and more congeniality for science. One textbook example, according to Merton, of this radical Protestantism are the Puritans, the English Puritans. There are others, but he focuses mainly on those. They're a textbook example. Like, because of their different outlook, their different values, they would be more likely to uh, perform especially practical science compared to non-Puritans, and therefore I've paved the way for the scientific revolution or acceptability of science to some extent. There's a lot more to be said about the Merton thesis, but this will do for now. Uh, a brief history lesson. Uh, the Puritans, they're an English reform movement, like in English Christian world. Yeah, uh, one before, yes. Uh, yeah, one. Uh, oh, two. No problem. I was so a uh, reform movement who wanted to make like the English church more Protestant, like do away with certain Catholic remnants. And things quickly went sour, and we ended up in the English Civil Civil War. Two fractions. Um, can I go one for it? Yeah. <laughs> Like on the left, we have Oliver Cromwell and the parliamentarians. They were mainly backed by Puritans. There were other motives, of course, as well, but religion was certainly one of them. And on the right, we have Charles I, the ruling English monarch. They uh, ended up colliding. Uh, the parliamentarians with Cromwell, they initially won the day, the Puritans won the day, and Cromwell ruled for some time. And then, but after that, after his death, like there was sort of Reaching or coming together of both sides, and we had the restoration of the English monarchy. So, this English Civil War, why is it important? Because it allows us to, it sort of forced people to take sides. Like the parliamentarians, they were roughly Puritans, and the royalists, they were roughly non Puritans, what was later be known as mainline Anglicans. And this allows us some sense of who was what and who had what values, which is important for this study. <coughs> 
So what it is group doing by assessing the Samaritan thesis, whether Puritan values indeed fostered acceptance of practical science, <coughs> mainly relies on secondary sources, although there were some primary sources involved in this like immersion, but we'll get to that. And he's uh, used some numerical data from our Royal Society and also looked into some motivations in the writings of Puritan scientists, see whether he, they had certain religious motivations for doing science. So his conclusion is overall fairly negative. Both the counting heads and both looking at Puritan motivations, they're not very powerful as evidence for the Merton thesis. There's no good evidence for a greater number of Puritans in the Royal Society. We'll get to that shortly. There are also a lot of non-Puritans involved in science that are very accepting of science. But the writings are at best ambiguous. Some values seem to support acceptance of science, but some Puritan values also go against it. Mainly the more radical, enthusiastic values that focus more on everything should be devoted to God, and people are sinful to and through, these would be detrimental to science often. And also many non-Puritans, what would later be known as Mainite Anglicans, also show clear motivations for engaging in science. This is way too short, but it gives you the gist of what's in the chapter. Now, what have you learned when you try to do this study again? So I've been looking at uh, all the sources that Brooks cited in his study again. I read up some backgrounds, read, uh, notes on uh, the Civil War, Puritanism. And what are some things that we encountered uh, while doing this replication? I'll focus on two issues. The issue of multiple words and interpretations, what Rick called meanings, things to that point. And also the importance of expertise from a searchship or background knowledge. I'll start with the first, the issue of multiple warranted interpretations. I mentioned one way of how Brooke assesses the Merton thesis is by counting ahead, looking at some numerical data, mainly like membership rates of the Royal Society. The Royal Society was founded after the restoration, after the monarchy got restored and the Puritan rule was over, basically. It was was and is the main scientific society in England. All the main scientists were a member and it was really dominant in shaping the scientific world around the time. And it is still the same. So what has Brooke been doing and others before him? Looking at like memberships for people who were a member of that royal society and see how many Puritans were there and how many non-Puritans and how do these compare? If the Merton thesis is true, you would expect more Puritans engaged in science by comparison, and especially more Puritans engaged in practical sciences. Now, here are the numbers. They're uh, from a study by Lottie Mulligan, which uh, John Brook cites. Yeah, it's, there are not that many. A lot of people, they don't count for all sorts of reasons. Some are like foreigners or non-active uh, members. But if you boil it down to people who were old enough to have taken a side in the English Civil War, there is this better. Like 23% for parliamentarians, they supported Cromwell and they opposed the monarchy. So they can be counted as Puritans, or less. And 53% count as royalists. So they were likely not Puritans. So this doesn't really chime well with the Merton thesis. If indeed Puritan values foster science, you'd expect a lot more parliamentarians, but this is not really the case. The point which uh, John Brooke takes on as an argument against the Merton thesis. But as Mulligan also notes, this picture changes somewhat if you focus on practical sciences. Agricultural reformers, still a uh, majority of royalists, but like a significant higher number of parliamentarians by comparison. If you focus on all the parliamentarians, more of them engage in agricultural reform compared to the royalists. Something similar for instrument makers, you know the change, very few royalists and a fair amount of parliamentarians. And also the naval experts, very few royalists and somewhat more parliamentarians. So parliamentarians do seem to be involved more in practical sciences by comparison, comparison to the royalists. So Puritan values might have something to do with that, as some suggested. 
Now, you think numbers are numbers. They're as clear as it gets, like numbers are clear. They only have one reading, one interpretation. This is not the case. Like Lottie Mulligan, who conducted the first study on these numbers for really those into the archives of the Royal Society, she acknowledges there are more Puritans engaged in practical sciences, which might support the Merton thesis, but she says, no, it really doesn't. Why? The sample size is too small. Radical Puritans were not members of the Royal Society because they opposed restoration. They were accounted among those. And there were probably other reasons why people go to accept science or practical science. She attributes these to the waning influence of religious ideas and more like tolerance or more like focusing on other things and religion. So she doesn't really see support for the Merton thesis there. Brooke doesn't see support either. Like he quotes this line from Milligan's paper that the typical background of a scientific enthusiast was not Puritan, but rather mainline Anglican or Royalist. So a lot of non Puritans were involved in science. And also, uh, there, there, there are um, a lot of non Puritans involved in our practical sciences as well. So it's at best ambiguous support for the Merton thesis, but probably not very strong, according to Brooke. Now, a third reading, let's call him the hypothetical Mertonian, which may or may not be me. Puritan, he, he notes that Puritans are indeed well represented and better represented in applied sciences, as noted by the numbers I showed you before which is somewhat surprising because the Puritans were fewer in number in the overall population. So a hypothetical Mertonian might see some support for the Merton thesis there as well. So we have here three readings, three meanings, three interpretations who are warranted or justified given the numbers I just show you, showed you. Now you can of course debate which is more likely. There all sort of things might come in. Background information, other evidence, the importance of school of thought. But maybe they're just all three warranted. Maybe that's just that. All three have something going from, for them. Maybe it's not all that clear. So that's one thing, the multiple interpretations. How am I doing my time? Five minutes should be fine. And then there's the issue of background knowledge, also alerted to by Rick in his introduction. Here, an example is the case of John Wilkins, a famous pioneer in, in experimental science from England. Like there are also like two readings, but also the issue of background knowledge is more clear here. Like on a naive reading of Wilkins' biography, his life seems to chime well with the Merton thesis. He was a science enthusiast. Like he laid the groundwork for some new work in experimental philosophy, also theorized about it. He did a lot of science himself. He also fostered science in others by being part of groups, like uh, teaching in uh, Oxford. And he was one of the first to embrace Copernicanism. So he was a really interested in science, in science especially, especially practical science and experimental science. And at first glance, he seems to be a Puritan. He supported Cromwell and the parliamentarians during the Civil War and had some theological affiliations there as well, at least in his youth. So, see, pro science and Puritan, which seems to match the Merton thesis quite well. But if you read Brooke, who has noted 20, 20 years of immersion in the topic and has a lot more background knowledge on this, how he looks at Wilkins. As an example, not of Puritan values, but of latitudinarian values fostered in science. Like he was a Puritan, but he quickly backed away from the more radical Puritan ideas. And especially when he got older, when he looked more like this, he grew to be more tolerant, he grew to be like less enthusiastic, more focusing on other things. So he advocated religious tolerance, proposed revision of certain concepts of biblical authority, and proposed to focus more on science and not so much on religious controversies. So he seems to be at best, at best an ambiguous Puritan, or maybe not even a Puritan at all at the end of his life, and still a science enthusiast. So Brooke sees Wilkins as an example 
against the Merton thesis due to this background knowledge, this additional information on Wilkins' life and his mentality. So these things matter, this background knowledge, which was firstly not available to me as a naive reader. So background knowledge, which was unavailable to me and other replicators when we first started doing the research. It is available. We talked to John Brook during a couple of meetings. I read up and also got more background knowledge on John Wilkins and the English Civil War. And there are other means to get this, but it is quite difficult, especially when it, because it's hard to write these things down background knowledge in full detail. Now, what does this learn us? This like way too brief foray in what we've been doing. Like the humanities are different. History is different than psychology. Psychology probably doesn't have so many valid interpretations alongside one another. But this need not be a problem. Like having an additional interpretation, an additional meaning might be a good thing. Like you could say the more the merrier, that a hundred flowers bloom, maybe not a hundred, but having more warranted, justified interpretations, I see that as a good thing. And maybe you can let future scholars read out the good from bad, or maybe decide which is the best one. Replications can also show the strengths and weaknesses of other interpretations, what they got going for them and what they got going against them, and might even show that some interpretations are no longer warranted given new data. This is also the case in other sciences, maybe, but to a far more limited degree. Here, data and numbers are far more straightforward, especially given the time difference with some studies in history. The issue of background knowledge. This shows that doing replications in history likely requires different heuristics, talking to the original researcher, immersion in sources, reading a lot. It also requires a different engagement with the subject, that it's not that all that clear cut, that there are other things going on, that there, it, does, it is more difficult to interpret sources and data. So this, are we done? <laughs> yes, no. There's a, a lot of open questions. We've gotten somewhere. There needs a lot more to be done. So I hope I've given you some information of what we've been doing. There's a lot more to be said, so 